Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've prepared a few slides and they will appear on the screen in a minute and here we are. Uh, what I'm going to discuss here is uh, precisely the new renewal of culture, uh, how we can look at the future as conservatives. And uh, if we can just... Uh, <coughs> I have written a book uh, which I brought here uh, called uh, 24 Conservative Liberal Thinkers uh, t trying to describe the tradition uh, that uh, we uh, seek our inspiration in. And uh, I would like to point out that this uh, uh, book is uh, available online free of charge. So you just have to Google my name and Conservative Liberal and you will find it. And uh, I start with actually uh, two thinkers, uh, Snorri Sturluson from Iceland, uh, I'm myself from Iceland, go on, yes, and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. And uh, <coughs> both of them, St. Thomas Aquinas and Snorri Sturluson, even if they were pre-modern, they uh, started with uh, basically recognizing that uh, the kings are under the same law as their subjects, and if they break the implicit social contract, they can be deposed. And this is uh, really the beginning of uh, classical liberal thought, which, uh, as I argue, is also conservative. And also, um, St. Thomas Aquinas, he justified the private property as bringing about peace and uh, prosperity, and he was also surprisingly liberal in moral affairs. He said more or less this in Summa Theologica, uh, man is a sinner, and the law should only pursue those sins of man that are harmful to other people. Leave alone the other ones. Uh, God has to deal with that. But the law has to deal with those sins that are harmful to others. And this, I believe, is a much better uh, expression of uh, the uh, connection between uh, morality and law than we have, for example, in John Stuart Mill. Uh, and here you can see, if we get uh, on the screen uh, this, uh, uh, this painting, you can see what happens if we do not have property. Because then everybody is fighting for the same cow because uh, nobody owns it. This is what happens without uh, private property rights. And this is precisely what St. Thomas Aquinas argued. Good fences make good neighbors. We divide up. Uh, the goods of the world, and uh, then we can peacefully uh, trade uh, with uh, one another. Uh, then we have the classical thinkers, one after another. The first one is John Locke. And what John Locke uh, really uh, showed us was that we can appropriate things from the commons without harming other people. We can remove things from the commons and make them into private property, and we can do that without harming anyone. So he offered a cogent defense, moral defense, of uh, private property rights. And then we had um, David Hume, who um, uh, argued that uh, the laws of justice and private property, they come, uh, <coughs> come uh, uh, into being because they are responses to natural scarcity. And we had Adam Smith, who expressed two powerful ideas that the left doesn't uh, still understand. One of them is that you can have order without commands. You can have a spontaneous order which can form itself without anyone being in command, anyone trying to uh, direct other people. This is a marvelous idea that we do not need uh, commands in order to have order. And the other one is that uh, uh, we can, uh, our actions, they can have all kinds of unintended consequences. So these are very powerful ideas. And if we move on, then we have uh, the, the four thinkers in the 18th and 19th century who uh, provided cogent arguments for yet another uh, pillar of the conservative liberal tradition, uh, which is free trade. And those guys, they are anti-Sweetenius from Sweden, uh, Frederick Bastia from France, uh, <coughs> Herbert Spencer from the United Kingdom, and uh, William Graham Sumner from the United States. 
in the uh, writings of those four thinkers, there is a very clear exposition of the case for free trade. And I believe that private property and free trade, uh, and then limited government, are already, uh, already described by St. Thomas Aquinas or Snorri Sturluson, these are three pillars of the political program of conservative liberals. Let's move on and just to remind ourselves that the trade is the key to prosperity, and then we go on. Uh, I believe that in modern times, actually, Austrian economics, with uh, Karl Menga and uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, provides the strongest intellectual argument for conservative liberalism. Uh, and if we just look at the arguments uh, in the next slide, then we have um, Karl Menga, he, show, uh, he basically solved the problem of price with his uh, marginal utility theory. He uh, uh, d d demonstrated how price is derived from scarcity and uh, marginal utility. And he, he basically also refuted Georgism and Marxism, which were the most fashionable political ideas in his times. Because uh, uh, neither land nor labor has, is of any special status uh, in the economy. Mises, he demonstrated the impossibility of uh, socialism uh, in his uh, uh, famous lecture to the Austrian Economic uh, Society in 1920, where he argued that um, planning had to fail because neither Lenin nor the other central planners had any idea of how to uh, organize uh, or choose between alternatives if there were no prices on them if the capital market was not a private market. It's a very deep insight, and I really advise you to read carefully uh, Hayek's uh, essays on, on this, because this is so crucial for us to understand why socialism is everywhere uh, bound to fail, and so does interventionism. Let's move on. Now, let us go to Café Landmann in Vienna in November 1918. There are two guys there talking together at the table. One of them is Max Weber, and the other one is Joseph Schumpeter. And Weber says to Schumpeter, the Bolshevik Revolution will end in a catastrophe. And Schumpeter says, well, it will be a good laboratory to test our theories. And Weber says, it will be a laboratory which will be full of corpses. And then Schumpeter very cynically shrugs his shoulders and he says, um, well, all laboratories have a lot of dead people in them. And Weber uh, becomes uh, very incensed, uh, very angry. He uh, says, this is outrageous, and he storms out. And Schumpeter uh, sits uh, back and he talks to the people who are uh, with him at the table and says, what, how can somebody behave like this in a coffee house? But Weber was right. According to the uh, Black Book of Communism, 100 million people died as a result of communism. And uh, hundreds of millions more suffered, had their youth, their cre creativity, their adventures, their innovations stolen from them by those uh, awful grey men uh, that uh, governed in the communist countries. So let's move on. And Hayek wrote a book published in 1944, The Road to Serfdom, uh, uh, where he really pointed out that um, socialism would uh, not deliver the goods, but socialism would also not uh, be uh, 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 co connected with freedom. It couldn't uh, coexist with freedom. And you see the painting here. This is a watercolor uh, from uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, there is a collection of the, those watercolors in the Hoover Institution in uh, California. Uh, there, is, uh, there are very few uh, photographs or paintings or illustrations of the Bolshevik Revolution and of the horrors and the cruelty of the Bolsheviks. But this guy, uh, a painter in uh, Russia, uh, Ivanov, uh, Vlad, um, he uh, did it uh, by stealth and uh, they are very interesting, his illustrations of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. I believe that Hayek uh, is uh, really the, uh, the, uh, the, mo the ablest and most interesting thinker of the conservative liberal tradition. And uh, Hayek posed a question 
uh, which I often discussed, and it is this. How can we, with the little knowledge we have, burdened by our inevitable ignorance, achieve so much? How was Western civilization, with its creativity, diversity, wealth, prosperity, progress, all kinds of interesting things that we see around us, how was it possible when each of us knows so little? And his answer was that the reason for this is that we can utilize the knowledge of one another. We can utilize uh, knowledge between uh, generations, between uh, our ancestors and ourselves, by traditions, and we can utilize knowledge in space at our own time by the price mechanism that tells us uh, what to do, uh, gently uh, points out to us where our um, abilities are best uh, utilized for the benefit of others, because all of that is reflected in prices, in demand and supply. So uh, Hayek uh, puts forward a theory of spontaneous order, which shows that uh, liberty is possible and indeed inevitable if we want to live a life of prosperity and liberty. Let's move on. Uh, Hayek in 1947 uh, founded the Mont Pelerin Society, and here you can see Hayek and a few other uh, eminent thinkers like Ludwig von Mises who was there, uh, and uh, uh, Iversen and others, and Hayek is in the chair, and uh, the Mont Pelerin Society played a crucial role, I believe, in uh, rejuvenating uh, the case for liberty after the Second World War. And then uh, in the next slide, you see, I just put it in for fun, uh, the next slide. Um, this is uh, uh, when the Montpellier Society celebrated its 50th birthday. And uh, on those photo photographs, there are two people present in this uh, hall. Uh, Alice Chapun was there. He, he is there in one place, and I am at uh, two. We, we both uh, started. Uh, uh, going to the Montpellier Society in 1980, and we have been member and active in it uh, since then. And if you take the next slide, you will see um, a little bit of the, uh, <coughs> uh, of the people that uh, really made the difference. Uh, the disciples of, uh, they were all actually, interestingly, uh, influenced by Hayek. Churchill, he read Hayek's book, uh, The Road to Serfdom, and once he ran into Hayek and he said to him, well, I read your book, it's very interesting, but I don't think this will happen in the Great Britain. Because he thought that they had uh, uh, such a flourishing civil society that uh, the corruption of socialism wouldn't take place there. And he was partly right and partly wrong. And then we have, of course, the two people who are also here, uh, Reagan and, uh, and Thatcher, both of them disciples of, of Hayek. Uh, and uh, I cannot resist telling you how Mrs. Thatcher greeted Hayek uh, at the first time they met after she had formed her first government in 1979. Uh, he was in London in September of that year. She formed her government in May, and he was there in September, so she invited him to lunch at 10 Downing Street. And she greeted him in the uh, entrance and said to him, and Hayek told me this story himself, uh, Professor Hayek, I know precisely what you're going to say. You are going to say that I haven't done enough. And you are absolutely right. And by this, of course, as Hayek laugh, uh, la uh, told us laughingly, she disarmed him. You know, he couldn't really criticize her after that. And uh, he was uh, very fond of her, and uh, she uh, also learned a lot from him, obviously. So let's move on. And uh, I wanted just to say a few words about uh, uh, conservative liberalism as a political project. Because uh, what we have been talking about here, Robert Tyler, for example, has uh, spoken about it, and many other people, the alliance of conservatives and uh, classical liberals was extremely successful in Europe uh, after the Second World War. We had uh, Konrad Adenauer, the conservative, and Ludwig Erhard, uh, the liberal, who uh, really rejuvenated um, uh, Germany, and uh, we had uh, a similar thing happening in Italy, where Luigi Arnaudi, the liberal, and Alcide Gasperi, the conservative, they joined forces, and Italy uh, rose from ashes. And then we had, um, in the 1980s, uh, uh, successful uh, 
liberalizations in very different societies. Re recall that. Uh, look at it and uh, think about it and reflect upon it that these were totally different societies that uh, had this um, reform, these reforms. Uh, we had the military junta in Chile. We had the social democrats in New Zealand. And we had the conservatives in England, in, in the United Kingdom, Mrs. Thatcher. And all of this was very successful. So you uh, had very different political regimes, uh, similar uh, liberal economic problems, uh, free market, private property, free trade, open economies, uh, cutting uh, government expenditure, stabilizing um, uh, the economy, etc. Uh, and all of this uh, had the same result. Very interesting. And I also, because I come from one of the Nordic countries, I cannot resist telling you that <clears throat> they are not at all an example of any successful social democracy. Uh, they are successful despite social democracy, but not because of it, because they had become rather prosperous with a um, good uh, uh, distribution of income before the social democrats took power. And uh, when they were going too far, when they were sliding towards the serfdom that Hayek had warned against in the, 19, uh, in the late 1980s, the Swedes retreated. They stopped the... Uh, expansion of the welfare state. They learn from their uh, experience. So I think actually Sweden is a good counterexample against socialism and not an example for it at all. And uh, then we have had in many of the Eastern Euro uh, Central and Eastern European countries successful reformers like Mart Lahr and Marcel Klaus. Uh, both of them actually uh, read over parts of my book because I discussed their reforms. Uh, there I knew, I know both of them and they were very uh, friendly and ab about it. In the chapter on Friedman, I go through uh, these reforms in many, uh, many countries. Then, uh, let's move on. Uh, when I was at Oxford in uh, the 1980s, uh, there were a few of us who were very interested in Hayek's ideas. And he came to uh, dinner with us. This is in the reception just before the dinner. And then there was dinner. He wanted to have the dinner at a Chinese restaurant. He said he liked Chinese food. Uh, he also liked uh, Bourgogne wines, uh, Burgundy wines, uh, and, and, and so on. He, he said to us also that he found Japanese food a little, little insipid, uh, just a matter of <laughs> uh, anecdotal uh, thing. But uh, in the dinner, after this, uh, I'm there kneeling at the, the, my master's feet, as you can see there. Um, in the dinner, he said, he gave a little speech. And he said to us, I am, of course, delighted that young people are interested in my ideas and discussing them. But uh, if you want to form a high society here at Oxford, because we were, uh, uh, we were asking him for permission to do so, if you are going to do, form a high uh, society at Oxford, you have to make me one promise, Hayek said. You have to promise not to become Hayekians, because I have noticed that the Marxists are much worse than Marx, and the Keynesians are much worse than Keynes. Uh, I'm not sure that I have always fulfilled the promise, but I will try my best in uh, the final section of my talk here. If we just move on, then as a good Hayekian, uh, I actually discuss two problems that young people are um, interested in. Poverty and environmental protection. I'm sure that you have discussions with your left-wing friends about both poverty and environmental protection. And it's very interesting uh, to uh, discuss poverty today because uh, <clears throat> in 1971, John Rawls published his book, Theory of Justice, where he basically described the poverty as the problem and said that the just society was a society where the poor would be as well off as they could be. Very simple, attractive idea. And uh, then, uh, uh, recently, up came Thomas Piketty, and he is not at all concerned with the poor. Uh, he is only uh, concerned with the rich, because uh, he is complaining that people are getting richer, and some people are getting much richer than others. So for him, wealth is a, is a problem. I don't think it's a problem for the rest of us. Poverty is a, is a problem. It's only for people who say, like Gore Vidal, Whenever a friend of mine has some success, something little inside me dies. You know, people who think like that, 
They, of course, uh, don't uh, look at uh, wealth as uh, a solution, as, as I do, but that's a problem. Uh, uh, so poverty, you know, the, uh, the, the free market system is the best uh, means that has been discovered to enable people to produce themselves out of poverty. So the poverty argument is really the strongest argument for capitalism, not uh, uh, the contrary. And uh, they, uh, the Fraser Institute in Canada have been measuring economic freedom and its connection to other, uh, other figures and numbers. And what you see on the screen is an extremely interesting fact. It is that the average income of the poorest 10% in the freest 25% uh, of countries quartile, uh, if you divide all the economies of the world into four parts and you look at the freest part, then the average income of the poorest 10% in this freest uh, quarter is higher than the average income of everybody in the unfreest part. Isn't this extraordinary? This statistics. It shows very well that if we bear in mind the interest of the poor, then we choose capitalism. And in fact, the poor choose capitalism. They always want to go from unfreer to freer countries. They want to go from Mexico to Texas. They, they, they wanted to go from East Berlin to West Berlin, from North Korea to South Korea, and so on. Then we come to another uh, issue which uh, uh, the left wing has used as uh, an argument against uh, capitalism. It is environmental protection. They don't seem to understand that uh, pr environmental protection requires protectors, somebody to protect. And that is owners. Why are elephants in Africa and rhinos in danger of extinction, but not sheep in Croatia or Iceland? It is because the sheep are privately owned. They have got somebody to protect them, to brand them, to, uh, to hinder anyone else in stealing them. Whereas the rhinos and the elephants have no owners. There are no stewards, there are no protectors. <clears throat> and basically, the, uh, the conservative liberal environmental program is to, to protect the environment by uh, defining private property rights. And uh, if we just uh, look at, uh, <clears throat> to remind ourselves of the next slide, uh, the Icelandic, well, the next slide is, if you look at the elephants, you know, they are, uh, they are the uh, victims of uh, poachers that are trying to steal uh, the ivory because the ivory goes for a lot of money on the international black market. If we would make the communities living close to the elephants, the owners of the elephants, we would change the poachers into gamekeepers and they would start protecting the stocks. And then if you, if you look at another uh, example, uh, which may be more realistic, it is in my own country, the fisheries. We have in Iceland, by uh, defining private uh, use rights to the fish stocks, we have basically developed a sustainable and profitable fishery. And uh, two of my books on it, uh, written in English, are available free of charge also. You can download them on the internet if you want to uh, explain the Icelandic fishery system. I'm not going to do it now at this late hour. So. <clears throat> Then I come to uh, an issue where I am fulfilling my promise to Hayek not to be a Hayek here. Because here I part company with Hayek. Hayek was, like so many Austrian, uh, Hungarian uh, citizens of the empire, uh, hostile to nationalism. Because he witnessed how nationalism uh, dissolved the Austro-Hungarian empire and on balance it was a better uh, entity than what replaced it uh, in many ways. But I think that we have to make a distinction between good and bad nationalism. Good natural and non-aggressive nationalism is simply that we recognize who we are. We identify with a community with uh, which we have share a history. They speak the same language. We in Iceland, we separated, for example, from the Danish in 1918 and formed our own national sovereign state because we were Icelanders, not uh, Danes. 
uh, the Finns, uh, they separated from the Russians because they were Finns, not Russians. The uh, Norwegians separated from the Swedes in 1905 because they wanted to be uh, Norwegians and not Swedes. And uh, the Slovenes, the Slovaks, the Croatians and others, they say we are who we are, we want to be friends with others, but we are not them. We are, we are different. We have our own identity and we want to foster and protect and preserve uh, that uh, identity consisting in our heritage and language. Then we have, of course, a bad nationalism, which is aggressive nationalism. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, the uh, uh, war in Ukraine is actually a war between good and bad nationalism. The Ukrainians want to be a nation. They want to have a so sovereign state. They want to be Ukrainians. They want to speak Ukrainian. They want to preserve the Ukrainian literary heritage. But the Russians, uh, or the clique uh, governing in the Kremlin castle, doesn't want to allow them this and uh, is attacking them because of that. Uh, they are mili uh, militant, aggressive nationalists. So we have this uh, uh, playing out just before our eyes. And let us uh, look at another slide, which uh, uh, illustrates uh, the um, bad side of nationalism. Here is a French teacher after 1871, who is teaching to his students that they really have to retake Alsace and Lorraine, or Alsace Lothringen, uh, and trying to, trying to encourage them to go to war to Germany over this. Uh, eventually, they, they did in 1914. Uh, now, I, ha I hold no opinions as to who should control Alsace or Lorraine, but I am just looking at those little kids there and wondering how many of them were killed in the wars between Germany and France. And uh, all those uh, teachers who are uh, creating uh, revanchism, jingoism, and uh, chauvinism. So, uh, summing up, I think that economics is not enough. Uh, if we are conservatives, we have to know which values we are, uh, want to conserve. Uh, and I think that those values are what ha has been developed in the West in the last uh, 1,000 years. Uh, the individuality, diversity, the will and ability of ourselves to make choices. Not to be only a part of a group, but also to be individuals. Uh, I also think that uh, it is only a half truth that economic freedom erodes uh, conservative values. Because at the same time as globalization and economic freedom does do that uh, to some extent, it creates new communities and new ties and new attachments. Just walk around the New York, which uh, may appear to you, to you to be a concrete jungle, and you will see if you just uh, listen carefully, and you step into a, a basement uh, cafe, and there the Irish are singing their national songs. You also have uh, Wall Street, uh, a special community with very strict rules. And all over New York, there are, there are invisible ties and attachments that have been formed inside and within and be, by, by capitalism, at the same time as other ties and attachments, of course, have been uh, broken. So, uh, capitalism is something that can renew itself, and the only remedy for freedom is more freedom, I think. Uh, so economic freedom is essential, but my final words would be that uh, we also need stability and continuity, and we need a recent defense of our culture and the values, and therefore it is so good to be here with New Direction and the Center for Cultural Renewal. Thank you very much.